All right, everyone, welcome back to Sid Reps Circo's Career Series Civilian Perspective. Today we have two rock star men of finance, uh, Connor Crandall, Daryl Hanks, both here at the Wharton School. Um, gentlemen, uh, why don't we start with with Daryl, uh, as he is El Prez. Uh, why don't we start with you and introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about your journey here to Wharton and, and what your plans are to do afterwards. Yeah, thanks, Wyatt. Um, I'm Daryl Hanks. You know, started my career in banking and then did private equity and then did a quick stint in operations at a private equity portfolio company at Wharton. Have been very deeply involved with the private equity scene. Um, the co president of the private equity club here, we've got about 1,000 members and naturally planning to go back to private equity after school. Great. Thanks, Daryl. Uh, Connor Crandall did two years of investment banking in New York, two years of private equity in New York as well. I'm a first year MBA student and, and similar to Daryl looking to kind of stay in the broader private equity, growth equity space post business school. As everyone can see behind me on brand for this conversation, uh, we have St. Gecko. Uh, Daryl, why don't you talk through what does it look like, you know, our, our audience largely is veterans, um, might be a few career switchers, but for those of us that did not do banking out of undergrad, what does the pipeline look? What are the, what are the skills that you're optimizing for uh, going into an analyst role and, and kind of walk, walk through what a firm is looking at uh, for a junior employee if you're going into investment banking? Yeah, I can probably take you through what the traditional process is, which begins in undergrad most of the time. And it's become more and more competitive over time. But when I was in school, kind of your sophomore year, you would start to get recruiters coming to campus in the fall, sometime in September. Um, they would be looking for past experience in finance, uh, you know, as close to banking as possible, as preferable but you could have maybe done evaluation internship or worked for a small private equity fund or a search fund, anything that was tangential to banking. Um, most students who were successful in that recruiting process, which, you know, as I said, happened sophomore year for a junior summer internship had already done at least one um, on average, two to three previous internships around finance, just to get a junior internship at a, at a bulge bracket bank. Um, so then you go to the bank and, for your junior summer internship. Yeah. And just just to clarify, what what does what qualifies as bulge bracket? Um, you know, what is what is the what are the the ranges of banks for those that are are coming at this from a very you know lower level of understanding? Yeah, you know, there's some argument about which banks are bulge or not. It's kind of a, a funny topic in the industry, but where leaders, uh, you know, they're the largest banks, Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan, Morgan Stanley, all bulge bracket. You know, you could argue Bank of America, Wells Fargo, maybe. Um, so that's one tier. And then there are, there those guys are usually full service. You know, they'll do both equity and debt, capital raises, M&A, um, there are other banks that are boutiques that they they call them elite boutiques like Lazard that might do just M&A. Evercore is another example. And then there are smaller firms that do smaller size transactions. Those would be middle market banks. And then you get even smaller into like regional investment banks. But, you know, regardless of size, bulge bracket or elite boutique or middle market, they all pretty much follow the same recruiting timeline and have the same expectations of previous experience. And you go for the junior internship, they have usually a formal training program. They'll teach you how to model, financial model, um, get very familiar with Excel, put together pitch decks, understand you know, the details of how to value businesses, how to manage transactions, uh, both on the buy and the sell side. And we can get into that. 
Um, if you're successful in that internship, they'll usually give you a return offer to start full time as an analyst right out of school. So Connor, tell me about the joy of being an analyst, the the fun uh, that happens. And and again, I want I want to emphasize for people watching this just just how immersed you are in this experience. So so tell me about your first. You know, what did you do? Two years as an analyst, and how much fun that was. Yeah, two years. I mean, I don't think I've ever heard anyone say fun and investment banking in the, in the same sentence. So congrats on, on being the first there. Um, you know, I think it's, it's, it's a grind. It is a bit, I would say, challenging from the sense that, uh, you know, a typical day, you know, most people will roll on around like 9 or 10 a.m. And then you kind of, honestly, you're twiddling your thumbs, but you're kind of working on lower priority things until, say, like 4 p.m. And then you might get like a bunch of work put on your desk. And then you'll probably be working on that until like two or three a.m. And, and what what is, I mean, what what are the responsibilities you have as an analyst when you talk about lower priority work? What are what are you doing as an investment banker? Uh, as an yeah, analyst? that's a great question. So basically, as an investment making analyst, you're essentially supporting you know whatever team you're on, and you're typically either on a product team. So this could be uh, M and A where you're acquiring or uh, selling a company. Or this could be a product team like the equity capital market. So you could be helping a company do an initial public offering or raise equity or debt, or you're assigned to a coverage group. In that case, you're assigned to an actual uh, industry such as healthcare or technology or uh, aerospace, where you cover just those companies and you work with your clients to uh, do whatever they're doing. And so sometimes the typical work might be uh, you know, creating a bunch of kind of script profiles, basically saying, here's a bunch of different acquisition targets that this company should go by. Other times it might be building a financial model to say, okay, this is how much our client can pay to buy this company. Or sometimes it's pitching, uh, making a pitch deck for uh, a prospective client saying, this is how much we think this client is worth. And this is our services to take them public. And so it's kind of, I'd say a variety of, uh, kind of Excel financial modeling items that, that Daryl touched on earlier. Uh, a lot of kind of PowerPoint work and kind of strategic, I'd say, analysis of trying to figure out, you know, either what the company does or, you know, where they should expand into and why. So kind of a healthy combination of that. And that's typically what you're you're doing day in, day out. So when you talk about modeling, um, Daryl, what, what does that mean? What are you trying to model out? Um, maybe this is a good time to get into... We, we talk about buy side, sell side, but what are those models? What is the purpose of, of digging into Excel until, you know, 2 a.m., 3 a.m.? Yeah, I mean, it really usually comes back to valuing a business. And usually the most straightforward way to do that is to take their current financial statements and project what you think they're going to look like in the future and derive a value on that using various methodologies. But Literally, you're just taking spreadsheets of their historical financial information, make assumptions about what their growth rate is going to be, what their cost structure is going to be, how much an acquirer might pay for it, how much debt they're going to put on the business. You know, you can drill very deep into these models and use all that to justify evaluation for the transaction. So when we say when we say buy side, sell side. Um, what, why would we, why are we using those terms? And obviously your, your sell side is an investment banker. Then you went, you went buy side, right? Private equity. But what, what does that denote when you talk about that? Yeah, ha happy to take that. So typically uh, on the sell side, you are working as an investment banker. Essentially you are usually, you know, representing the seller in a possible transaction Whereas if you're on the buy side, that typically means either call it uh, private equity or kind of the public market hedge fund world, where you're on the other side uh, purchasing either the underlying security for a hedge fund that's typically going to be some type of equity or debt instrument. Or if you're private equity, you're actually purchasing the company. And so that's kind of a clear delineation in if you're the, the buy side versus sell side. What, when someone comes out of an MBA, and like like a lot of the audience will be doing, they get to an investment bank and they would go to a summer internship, get their full-time offer, go back, but they would be recruiting for an associate role. 
what what did you expect of associates? What did you think of associates? And and what should someone that wants to be an associate be able to do? Uh, Daryl, maybe hear from you first. Yeah, so it really depends on the bank, but on average, I'd say the associate is ultimately responsible for all the output of the transaction. Um, so that would include the final pitch deck or the presentation, as well as the model. The analyst might be the one building everything, but the associate is checking their work, making sure it's right. He's or she is directing, um, you know, when the analyst finishes everything and he's, he or she's working with the vice president above them uh, to make sure everything stays on time in terms of the larger deal process. Um, associates will also start to interact with third parties like lawyers or advisory firms. Uh, the VP usually runs most of that, but associates are expected to gain exposure and in, in some cases play a level up, so to speak. How much, how much did you, when you, when you worked with associates that were fresh out of an MBA, you, you talked to Daryl about how much experience you had to have before you even went into an investment banking internship. So it wasn't like you were fresh. Um, a lot of people obviously are coming fairly fresh uh, from an MBA program. Maybe they're veterans, maybe they're, they're pivoting from a marketing background. Uh, but Connor, what did you kind of expect from your associates and how much did you I mean, how much was there a balance between them kind of leading you and them kind of like managing your workflow? And, and how did you how did you balance that relationship? Yeah, I think that's an interesting question, because I, I think, frankly, there's a little bit of kind of underlying tension between the call it experienced analysts. So this is like going mean, to be a second year analyst and a first year associate, particularly an MBA associate, because typically these, these MBA associates, to your point, why, you know, they're fresh, they're coming from kind of a, a non-finance background. Typically, they just frankly don't really know how to do the job yet. Whereas that second year analyst who's already done a year of banking, you know, knows how to do the job. And so typically, you know, I found is the, the best MBA associates were the ones who realized that, while they were, uh, you know, theor you know, fundamentally they're at a higher level and, and quote unquote on, on in charge, but at the end of the day, they don't really know how to do the job. And the best kind of MBA associates were the ones who would be willing to learn from the second year analyst, learn how to do the jobs, so maybe spend a year kind of figuring out how to do their job, building their reputation, and then from there they can start to lead more, kind of play a bigger role. But it feels like the you know conflict would naturally arise when you had a kind of an MBA associate coming in and kind of starting to, you know, boss people around with uh, the junior team saying, hey, you know, you don't know how to do the job yet. You haven't, you, know, you haven't really kind of earned your respect around here yet. Yeah, Daryl, what, what did you expect and how did you manage that relationship? What would, what would you tell to an associate that was going to manage younger version of you? Yeah, looking back on it now, I would say a lot of associates projected potentially that insecurity of them not knowing the job by being overly authoritative over the analysts who, who did know. And so that created tension and made the analysts not want to work for those associates. So I'd say in the first, like Connor said, six months to one year, really focus on developing a good emotional rapport with the analyst, be humble, be willing to learn. Um, you are still technically above them in the hierarchy and you will call the shots ultimately, but it needs to be much more collaborative rather than hierarchical as you might expect it to be. And why? I mean, you talked to Connor about working until like two to 3 a.m. Hey, how often, you know, if someone looks at that and thinks that's an exaggeration, what are you doing until 3 a.m.? And why can't you just, you know, save the work until tomorrow? Yeah, I, I think it's it's largely because investment banking is a bit of a roller coaster in the sense that you are kind of, you know, sprinting for a few weeks on a certain uh, pitch deck or a deal. And then once you finish that deal, you might have a week of kind of, you know, slower, slower time. And then you'll ramp back up on another project. And a lot of these projects have kind of very pressing deadlines. And I think, you know, investment banks are notorious for kind of, I'll say not maybe being run in the most structured or uh, streamlined way. And because of that, a lot of the work will kind of start to trickle down from, you know, the senior partner to the VP, to the associate, to the analyst. 
And that takes time and trickles down throughout the day. And so oftentimes you don't get started working until, you know, in the afternoon. And then you have to work, you know, 10, 15 hours to get all the work done, which is why you know, you're forced to, to stay up late. Uh, and I will say, you know, as you start to get more senior, I think, uh, you know, a lot of people will start to come in a little bit later the next day if they had a late night. Um, I wouldn't say, you know, it's 2 or 3 a.m. every night, but it's still, you know, you, you work hard and, you know, you're going to put in a lot of late nights in banking, particularly as a, a junior analyst or associate. Yeah, Daryl, what was your experience like, uh, you know, for people that think that the workload is an exaggeration? No, I mean, it's it's definitely real. It does vary on the margin by group, whether you're coverage or product and which bank you're at. If you're at a bank that leads every deal, you are probably not going to be pitching as often. Um, more deals will come to you. And so you might have more control over your schedule at, at the senior level. But fundamentally and structurally, banking is a client facing job. And so you're always serving someone else who they're on their own timeline. They don't really care if they burn you out. Um, this might be a Fortune 500 company that's, you know, they answer to public shareholders, high pressure. They don't care what the deadline is. You need to meet it. And then on the other side, culturally in banking, everyone's trying to impress their boss. And that means sometimes the iterations of the pitch deck might go through, you know, five or six iterations where it could have been okay after two or three, but everyone's really trying to impress the next level up. And uh, it's extremely hierarchical. So when an analyst puts it together, he'll send it to the associate. The associate will, will review, send back any changes to the analyst. They'll make the changes, send it back to the associate. Once he signs off, they'll send it to the VP. He'll review, send changes to the associate who will send them to the analyst. And it'll go like this all the way up to the MD two or three times. And often you're not getting those comments back in a super timely manner from the VP and up. And they'll kind of just drop them on your desk at 10 p.m. before they get the train to go up to Connecticut. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the migration to Connecticut is kind of when you know you, you become senior, right? Um, yeah. For, for those, for those vets watching, uh, yeah, it's the, it's the, the MD is, is, is like your battalion commander. It's like the O5 that has, has been at it for a while, uh, as, as probably 10 plus years of experience, if I'm, if I'm not wrong, uh, correct me guys, but 10 plus years of experience, maybe up to like 20. Um, and you both, um, you both transitioned out of banking and, and kind of made what seems to me to be a very uh, hoped for exit, very difficult exit to make. But um, you both went by side, right, in, into private equity, uh, which isn't the only exit, but but private equity is, is where I think most young bankers want to be and where a lot of people to become associates think they might end up uh, eventually. Uh, Connor, tell me about why did you decide to go into private equity and, and what was the process like to get there? Yeah. Um, you know, I knew I always wanted to go to private equity. It was kind of the, the end goal or the, I should say, kind of medium term goal coming out of undergrad. And I felt like in order to get into private equity, the best shot I had was going through the investment banking route. As typically most of these private equity firms largely pull their talent pool from uh, investment banks or to some extent management consultants. And so I felt like if I was in New York doing investment banking, I would get a lot of you know, looks and opportunities to join a private equity platform that was really of interest to me. And that's that's ultimately where I wanted to be. And so that's largely the the approach I took. And Daryl, what was your what was your process like to get into private equity? How how difficult was that to actually land? I mean, is is it is it automatic? I mean, is it something that 90% of people are able to do? No, it's uh I, I can't put a number on the exact percentage, but it's a small percentage of bankers who make the transition. They usually top rated in their groups, uh, well liked, well respected, and who have done deals, which is sometimes out of your control, um, depending on the market or your bank or your group or even your deal team. So generally recruiting firms or headhunters manage the whole process. They've been starting to reach out to analysts as early as their first weeks on the job as bankers, two years before they would even start as private equity associates. And they'll gather your preferences and 
ask you about your deals, your experience. If it's relevant in their mind, they'll match you up with some of their clients. And when the clients are ready to hire, it'll be uh, very intense. And usually, if you're successful, it's usually a short process. Um, but they might send you an email at midnight and say, hey, you have an interview with this fund tomorrow at 8 a.m. And you'll have to make some excuse for your banking team why you're not in the office and you'll suddenly fall ill or your grandma will die for the fourth time. And you'll go and interview with these firms all day till 10 p.m., just meeting a dozen people, having a live case study, uh, and they'll let you know it, that day or the next few days. And it's a very rushed process. Um, it, it, it's very intense, and you know, just a small percentage of people are actually ultimately successful. How does the banking recruiting process, uh, in, in terms of skills and what they're asking you? Uh, Connor, how does how does that compare to what you're doing for private equity recruiting? Yeah, you know, I I think banking is a little bit more kind of focused on culture, the willingness to work hard hours, and kind of just the, I'd say a basic level of kind of a technical understanding. Whereas private equity is much more focused on understanding if you can think like an investor and you can put that investor hat on and make informed kind of data-driven decisions around what's going to give you the, the biggest return. And I think that's largely what these PE firms are searching for. They want kind of, you know, the, the skills you learned from banking, which is going to be sharp, uh, willing to work hard hours, uh, you know, quick with, with the numbers. But they also want to understand that you can think like an investor. And that's largely why uh, I'd say private equity recruiting is a mixture of kind of like technical interviews, as well as just broader uh, behaviorals around, um, you know, why private equity and also uh, just, you know, what you think makes a good investment and kind of thinking through certain investment frameworks. Yeah, so we, we talked about how at the bank, you're, you know, like we said, uh, sell side, you're putting together deals, you're helping, you know, break down whether a deal should be, you know, completed, kind of giving advice and advisory and advisory capacity, connecting you know, two sides, what is it, what's the difference? What's, what's private equity doing? What's the purpose of private equity and, and why do we, you know, why do they call it buy side? Um, I can give an abbreviated answer. So, I mean, the purpose of private equity is literally to make money. Um, you are making money for your limited partners who are the investors in your fund that often are, endowments or pension funds. So you can think of it as I need to make money for the public employees of California, right? They might be a large investor of yours. And the way you do that is buying a business with a combination of equity and debt, hopefully improving it and selling it for a profit and distributing those profits. And why other than keeping a portion for yourself? Why are you going to be buying it with debt? I think this is a, a, a a thing that really clarifies the purpose or how private equity makes money to a lot of people. Explain that mechanism, Daryl, of how you're using debt um, to buy a company and, and return money to the people that have given you money in the form of equity, right? Yeah, I mean, the most simple cliche example is, uh, you know, the same process you go through to buy a house. You could buy a million dollar house with a million dollars of cash or a million dollars of equity and it might appreciate in value to 2 million bucks and you made a million, you made two times your money. Or you could buy it with 90% debt and 10% of your own money, put in 100,000, the value of the house goes from a million to 2 million, you pay back the 900,000 of debt and you're left with 1.1 million. So you turned your 100,000 into 1.1 million, right? Uh, so a much higher return because you use the debt. And that same concept applies to companies, right? Um, in this example, it's it's closer to buying a house with a mortgage and then renting it out to tenants and collecting those mortgage payments and then selling the house after, you know, four to five years. And the investment bankers, their their role in that transaction is where? Yeah. Typically, the investment bankers are the one who are in, in Daryl's metaphor here. They're, they're the ones selling you the house. And so the investment banker might call up, you know, XYZ private equity firm and say, hey, 
we have this great asset. They do, you know, this and in this industry, and they're going to sell themselves. You know, let us know if you want to come bid on the process and and take a look at the the kind of financials and the operating data, and then come up with the valuation. And so they're the ones who are, you know, that have been hired by the company to sell that company. How how do investment banks a get get their money and b make money if private equity is the one that's buying assets running those assets selling them what is what is the mechanism by which an investment bank makes all the money that they make yeah so investment banking you you make your money based on fees and you make fees when you do a deal so typically an investment banker gets hired by an organization so a company to either to sell the company or to do an ipo or an equity or a debt raise for the company and once they complete that transaction they get paid their fees. Uh, you know, if we take a look at the M&A side, which is where the private equity firm is going to buy a company from an investment bank who is essentially helping the company sell themselves, they get a cut of the purchase price. And usually you negotiate beforehand, the investment banker will negotiate with the company and they'll say, if we sell you for, you know, a billion dollars, we'll get X percent. But if we sell you for, you know, $1.5 billion, we'll get X percent plus some additional uh, income to represent kind of the increased purchase price that we sold you at. And so banking is completely incentivized to do deals and do as many deals as they can, because that's how they get paid. Yeah, that's, that's a, a great summary. Um, the other option, one other option um, that we have friends that, that did is, is public markets. Um, so, you know, public equity, uh, private equity is obviously like you guys said, you, you have, um, a private investing pool. It is, you're not buying stocks. You have a, a company that's privately owned by the, you know, by the equity group that you have, um, explain to us what, what a public market or public invest in, investing would do Daryl. And, and how, how did you decide to go private equity versus um, staying in banking versus going into like public investing. Yeah. So there's a few different flavors in public investing, but the thing that's common among all of them are they're, pub they're buying and selling publicly listed securities. Right. So on the equity side, this would be a, you know, stock of a company that's on a formal stock exchange. Think Apple, Google, you know, most large companies. Uh, the way they do that day to day is largely reading company information in the annual reports, 10Ks and 10Qs, coming up with a thesis and putting the money to work in a, in a much more liquid market. Contrasting that to private equity, you know, if you buy the equity in a, in a private company, there's a lot less liquidity. You have to be a, a qualified investor, retail, you know, regular individuals hardly ever have access to be able to do that unless maybe you're employed by the company. Um, in public investing, you're often not focused on improving the business because you only own a very small percentage of the company in most scenarios. And uh, in private investing, you know, if you're in a majority transaction, you own the business, you want to improve it, you decide when it sells. Uh, you decide what you you do to the business. Why, Connor, do my MBA classmates all tell me that private equity is fast paced and and for the most part somewhat interesting, and they even the kids going into public markets all tell me that it's a boring job, but it pays a lot. What what's like what's why is it so boring, or is it maybe it's not. Are you saying uh, pri private equity is boring or uh, public? No, no, is boring? opposite. No, and I'm I'm going to talk to some people, so I'll I'll give them their day in court to justify why you know we'll we'll go a lot deeper into public markets. But why, like, why not public markets? Why don't you go to Pimco or or some other big public investing firm, T. Rowe Price? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. I don't want to comment too much because I think there's a little bit of this rivalry between the the public market folks and the uh the private market folks um you know personally uh i just feel like it's easier to try to create value if you are 
looking at a private market, whereas public market, you know, everyone's operating on more or less the same information and you're really kind of searching for an information edge or to, to have a different viewpoint on something that the, you know, the, the broad majority of the, the investor world has a, has a different viewpoint on. And I felt like that just necessarily wasn't maybe something that I was as good at, whereas uh, I really like this idea of a private equity investor of, you know, identifying what you think a really cool business is, purchasing it, and then actively running it as well and improving it. Whereas, you know, to the point Daryl raised in the public markets, you're less actively uh, running your business. There are some kind of, you know, public market strategies out there that take a little bit more of an active role in kind of shaping an organization, but largely that is reserved for, you know, private markets. And that's, that's something that really fascinated me. Yeah. I'll, uh, I'll see if the public markets guys will, will, will be a little bit less, uh, guarded their answer so maybe i can get jeff to uh to come on and, and tell us why public markets are better uh or maybe luke uh maybe i'll get luke on so daryl the the difficulty i think i think the people underestimate how difficult it is to get into private equity i've, I've kind of you guys have, have understated that um and i know you guys don't want to stroke your own egos but but i will that uh getting into private equity is is really insanely hard and it's really really hard as an analyst who went to a top bank um which is reserved you know largely for people of what we what you'd call target schools right at these big banks but why is it so hard to do it as an associate so if i go work at jp morgan bank of america lazard um why why can't i just go for two years talk to a headhunter and jump into an associate role at a private equity fund. Um, kind of describe the mechanisms that are at work there, Daryl. Yeah, I could talk about this for a long time. I think the first thing that comes to mind is in banking, you're a middleman between two parties who have skin in the game, right? A buyer and a seller. Um, it also, if you make a mistake as an analyst on something in the presentation or in the model, you'll have four or five levels of people above you to check that mistake. Um, when you flip over to private equity, you now or your fund has skin in the game. If you make a mistake, you're losing money for investors. Uh, if you lose money, if you make a mistake in banking, it's probably going to get caught. And if it doesn't, you're still going to get your fee because the deal's still probably going to go through. That company that hired you to do the deal might not hire you again, so you might lose some business and your team will be very disappointed in you, but you didn't directly lose the money, whereas in private equity, like it's in your hands, essentially. Yeah, so Connor, when you look at uh, people coming from like an associate background, um, what what roles would be available if you had stayed in investment banking, gone to become an associate, what are the typical kind of like exits, right? Other than staying and just climbing the ladder at a bank, becoming an MD and doing that, what, what might someone that is an associate do with the yeah. skill set that you gain? That's a great question. And I think the exits are slightly different if you started as an analyst versus coming in as an associate, you know, to the point that Daryl raised, I think the private equity industry is almost, more structured in a way to to hire um, analysts who are looking to be promoted to associates and because of that you know you don't see a lot of associates who are taking like a lateral or a step back in their careers to go to a, a private equity firm where they're like a year one associate or as they might have been a year two associate or a year three associate at an investment bank um, but if, if you're leaving banking i think there's kind of three common paths one into private equity which is obviously have talked at length about uh, two going into the public markets, which could be either you know the broader kind of hedge fund world, or uh, could be uh, that T. Rowe Price, uh, you know, some other kind of mutual fund or you know public market investor. I think the third point, which you, you see fairly frequently, particularly with I'd say MBA associates who realize they don't want to do banking forever, is they go work for one of their clients. You know, maybe you're. Uh, MBA associate in a tech fund and you uh, help, you know, Google do a number of M&A transactions and you kind of become close with the team and you realize you want to go, you know, work for 
uh, one of your clients and they're a corporate dev or a strategy role. And so that's that's pretty common to see people you know, leave their, their job to go work for a client or just in the industry in general. Yeah, I, I saw a guy yesterday, um, was Ranger Regiment in the Army, uh, went to Booth uh, for his MBA, then went to Bank of America in New York, or excuse me, then went to BCG in New York, uh, did two years at BCG, then started as an associate at uh, Bank of America, and that's where he is now, which seems like someone that just, they just want to experience every variety of pain. Um, so I don't know what he'll do next, maybe like, you know, join the French Foreign Legion or something. But um, that was that like blew my mind. I I don't think I've ever seen someone that wants to do three things that just, you know, everyone in them tells you like, this is painful. Um, for the for the vets that are watching, you guys have probably worked with veterans. Um, what have you what is what have you thought about the veterans you've worked for? What would you tell vets that are that are going into banking? Um, you know, both skill sets that they can leverage and, and things that you would advise them to learn um, to be ready day one in, in into banking. Yeah, I can start with that. I'm curious to hear Connor's thoughts on this too, but um, banking is extremely hierarchical. I think having operated in the military, veterans have a, a very good understanding of that and how to navigate that politically and how to deal with inefficiency, which from what I've heard from some of the anecdotes you've shared with me, Wyatt, that uh, often runs rampant through the armed oh, yeah. services. So having a, a high pain tolerance as well, not only for the hours, but some of the bureaucracy are skills you can definitely leverage. I think on the things to watch out for is that point we mentioned earlier, just being cognizant of the fact there are people there who, you know, including second year analysts, who are below you, who have more relevant experience, being open to learning from them, um, being able to have a softer approach in, when you need to get things done. You know, finance typically is a very, it's very particular in the way it likes things done. And it's all about tradition and making everything look nice. So. You can't really come in like a bull in a china cabinet and shake things up and jam things through, right? You need to kind of massage the egos of the people above you, use very precise language, use uh, a lot of courtesy and, you know, just be wary when you, when you come in that you're the new guy and make sure you get people on your team before you start adding levels of aggression. Yeah, that was, that was a great answer, Daryl. I'll maybe kind of add on to my thoughts here. And as I just scribbled some thoughts down, um, you know, I think similar to Daryl, you know, I, I really enjoyed working with the vets. I found that I really kind of got along well with them and, and found that they were, you know, very hard workers and they had this, I'll call it, I think Daryl used the same term, a pain tolerance, which I think you, you need to have. And not necessarily that it's physical pain, but it's just kind of long hours uh, very kind of annoying processes you have to go through. And so you have to have some level of being able to kind of be long suffering in that sense. You know, I think a, a, another kind of few important skills or uh, things you need in your tool belt is you need to be humble. You got to realize that, you know, these first year or second year analysts are going to run circles around you. You know, a lot of these kids are going to be Ivy League kids who are you know, very bright. They had parents who have been in high finance their whole life and they've been exposed to this for, you know, 10, 15 years and have kind of been groomed to, to work as a junior investment banker, and they're going to be really good at their jobs. And I think it's important to be humble and to learn from them and kind of learn from what they're doing to in order to learn how to do your own job. Another uh, kind of important component is, I think you got to realize that banking has some politics in it. There's kind of, you know, what gets spoken, and then there's kind of the unspoken um, way of doing things. And you have to be very careful to not disrupt that and almost play into the, I'll call it a little bit of the politics game of just kind of playing into the way things uh, actually get done. And then I think the final point is, and, and Daryl brought this up, is there's there's a way things are typically done. Whatever it is, whether it's the formatting of a pitch deck, the way the you know the page numbers or the position they're put in, there's, there's a precedent way that everything is done. 
And you do not want to be the nail that sticks out. You want to make sure, you know, whatever deliverable you have is kind of impeccable from a formatting and, and presentation standpoint. As oftentimes that, that presentation is reflective of the banker and kind of is their, you know, the work quality they're putting in front of the client. So they are very um, focused on ensuring that, that work quality is perfect. Yeah, no, that, that, that's great advice. Uh, I just want to close up talking a, a little bit more. We, we just, you know, mentioned people that are going to go into banking perspective there. Cause that's, that, that really is the vast majority of vets. Um, for those, you know, I don't want to discourage anyone from shooting for the stars, following their dreams, but um, just to temper expectations and to help people understand how difficult it is to break into private equity. Um, private equity or banking, you, you, you two talked about the training element of it, but Daryl, uh, how much of private equity is training um, when you show up? How much tolerance is there for someone to to learn even on a one, two, maybe three month ramp like there probably would be at a bank or, or a Fortune 500 company or, or consulting? Yeah, again, it's, it's dependent on firm, but on average, you know, each firm has some sort of training, whether it's formal or informal. But compared to banking, it's much less and there's much less room for error as well because, for example, if you're at a bank, you're doing an M&A deal, you might, on a very large deal, you might make a $20 million fee. A $20 million deal in private equity is, it's almost not even private equity. Um, you know, you're doing billion dollar transactions plus at, at some of these firms. So there's very little margin for error and there's very high expectations and the training is not going to give that the firm gives you is not going to give you all the skills you need to be successful. That's why they usually hire ex bankers and in rare cases, ex consultants, because they've had, you know, multiple years of 80 hour work weeks, digging into the technicals, knowing everything at a very deep level of detail so that, you know, they trust you're not going to miss some of the basics or make some of these, you know, basic mistakes on such large deals. Yeah. And um, we'll be talking later to some folks that are doing private equity operations, but that 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 is one way that, you know, Daryl and Connor talked about purchasing the company, running the company. A lot of the times they, they want bright, hungry people to drop into those companies and run those. Um, it doesn't take quite the finance chops that the investing side does. And that that is one role that I think vets um, thrive in and, and and can do very well in and, and should look at. So we'll, we'll talk more about that. Um, it's important to differentiate that when someone says uh, private equity, it's it's a bit for those vets listening, like someone that talks about being a ranger versus being ranger qualified. There's a, a stark difference. And if someone that was a private equity operator were to tell Daryl that uh, they work in private equity, um, you know, versus I'm I'm in private equity operations. That that probably be a little bit of like, what are you what are you trying to pull over on me? Um, gentlemen, thank you very much. Um, Daryl, how many how many private equity jobs have been given out so far at Wharton? 300, 400? This is the Wharton School of Finance, right? Yeah, that would be amazing. As you know, as the president of the club, I'd be thrilled. It's uh probably 5% of that number, unfortunately. So, you know, there's, from what I've heard at my vantage point, it's about a dozen to 15 offers across the whole landscape. And uh, that's similar or higher than Harvard and Stanford. And I can't verify that for sure, but anecdotally, that's my understanding. And schools uh, and like- you have a, a club. Yeah, go schools ahead. Schools like Duke, um... Texas, great schools, by the way. I mean, I have, I have friends that are getting offers at Facebook and, and Google from those schools. But for private equity, what's what's the landscape like at, at top 10, you know, even other M7 type schools? Yeah, I mean, I think it's definitely possible from any top school. The, the reality is most of this hiring goes along alumni lines. And so if you want a sense of, your odds, you should look at, you know, 
here are my top 20 funds I would love to work at. Go through their whole team pages and see how many people have the same MBA that you're going to get, and that will give you a good sense of the relative odds. Um, you know, overwhelmingly, these people have gone to Harvard and were in, you know, more Stanford in the tech sphere. There are edge cases of, of other programs sneaking in. Um, so I, I'll leave it up to people to do their own research there. I don't want to speak too definitively on that. Sure. I mean, Mr. Tepper, right? He was a, a Carnegie Mellon MBA and probably made made more money than all of us probably will make combined several times over. So, um, you know, he's he's probably uh, he'd probably take umbrage at me even uh, suggesting that you can't from other places. But but I just really want to highlight for those listening, it, it's very difficult. Everyone, you know, private equity is the golden goose that many people chase. And as veterans, we're, we're very fortunate to have a lot of different benefits from our time in service. And uh, unfortunately, being able to work in private equity is, is generally not one of them. Um, there are some there are some cases, but it's difficult. Um, before we go, uh, guys, what's your uh, what's your Super Bowl bet for this weekend? Connor, we'll, we'll start with you. Uh, I'm going Chiefs as I'm a Packers fan and just can't can't root for the Niners, so I'll, I'll take the Chiefs. Daryl, what are you what are you feeling? I gotta go Niners. I will be a Bay Area resident here in less than three months, so I think I need to get ahead of it and hope that Brock Purdy saves us from a Taylor Swift Super Bowl win. Yeah. So um, don't let your wife hear that. And um, yeah, you'll be at Levi Stadium for a few games next year, hopefully. So you you have been fortunate to be one of those dozen or so that does have an offer. So congrats on that. But thank you again. We're grateful that you guys would stop by. And Connor, I know people can reach out to you if they need help with banking. How would they do that? Yeah, I'm on uh, Leland, uh, which is like a peer-to-peer -peer mentoring site where you can hire me. I do uh, a lot of kind of private equity prep and uh, investment banking prep for for kids looking to break into the industry. So you know, feel free to reach well, out if you're if you're interested. We'll throw that in the show notes. Daryl, are you are you uh, open? If if people have you know, um, people are deciding between offers, private equity, banking. How how would they reach out to you? LinkedIn. Yeah, feel free to send me a message on LinkedIn. My email, my personal email is in my profile as well. So if I don't get back to you on LinkedIn, feel free to follow up with an email. Great. All right, gentlemen. Well, thank you. Have a uh, wonderful weekend. Awesome. Thanks, Wyatt. Good to see you and good to chat Bye. with you.